Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg. My name is Susan Bernor, and I'm filling in today for our minister, the Reverend Jack Donovan, who will be back next week. I'm happy that you found your way to our session this morning. We'll start today with a brief reading, then our music director, John Arterton, will lead us in one of our favorite hymns, Blue Boat Home. After some announcements and joys and concerns, Janae Johnson, our religious education coordinator, will share a story for all ages. I'll then lead a brief meditation and share a reflection on our topic, the inevitability of spring. We'll finish with some great music by John and his husband, James Mack, and you'll hear Annie, Ma Annie Hall singing Spirit of Life as the service closes. So let's get started. I'll repeat the words to our coven now as we have a virtual chalice lighting. You might want to say them along with me. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love, and to help one another. Thank you. This reading is from John Burens, a UU minister and former UUA president, in his book, A Chosen Belief. It's his ideas on those three that abide, faith, hope, and love. He says, faith is not ultimately about believing something in spite of the evidence. It's living with courage, gratitude, and integrity in spite of life's inevitable losses. And hope is not knowing that everything will turn out all right, either for yourself or for everyone on earth. It's more like directing your life toward a point on the horizon you can't see beyond, but a point we all have to aim for if there is to be a worthwhile future for anyone. And finally, love. Love is not just a greeting card sentiment. It's more like living here and now, serving justice, doing works of mercy, and walking humbly with one another before a mystery that transcends us all. Now I'll turn this over to John. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Gulfport. We're gonna to begin today's service with one of our favorite UU hymns, Blue Boat Home. Oh, below me I feel no motion, standing on these mountains and plains, far away from the rolling ocean, still my dry land heart can say, I've been sailing all my life now, never harbor home. Have I known the wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. I give thanks to the waves upholding me. Hail the great winds urging me on. Greet the infinite sea before me. Sing the sky my sailor's song. I was born upon the fathoms. Never harbor or port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. Thank you, John. We all love Blue Boat Home. As you all know, the church is still physically closed to gatherings. 
but for our online events, whether they're on YouTube, recordings like this one, or interactive Zoom meetings, you can go to our website, uustpete.org, and click on the big red banner that says, click for information about gatherings. Our communications team is doing a fantastic job making this access as easy as possible while working on an upgraded website. We're really grateful to them. For joys and concerns, today I am very sad to have to share that a much-loved member of our congregation, Thomas Bray, died on Wednesday. Tom will be missed so much, especially by his closest church friends, including Liz Lawrence and Kevin Wombolt and also by the entire Buildings and Grounds Committee, where he did so much work for the church. Pastor Jack is talking with Tom's family and will be letting us know as soon as some services are arranged. There are several joys to share. Their high school is closed, but Kaya and Nazira Allen's family is giving them a senior week anyway. The girls woke up to songs and decorations in their yards and at their tante's yards, Sabina and Jerry, next door. Plus, they had Taco Tuesday. What could be better? Congratulations, Nazira and Kaya. Many of you know that Doug Walther, Lisa Bean's fiance, was hospitalized last month for COVID-19. The great news is that he and Lisa have now both tested negative for the virus. They'll soon be going back to Massachusetts for the summer. And then even more big good news, they'll be back in Florida in November and they're gonna get married. So we're really happy for them. We heard from Ruth Bentley that she's busy sewing masks and taking walks outside in this gorgeous weather. So she's obviously reco recovering well from her hip surgery. Finally, a big joy about all the volunteering being done. People are making and delivering meals, sewing masks, buying and delivering fresh vegetables, writing postcards to get out the vote, and mo most importantly, perhaps, calling and checking in on various people in the congregation. A lot of people are making cash donations to make all these things possible, and lots of other things that I don't even know about. Plus, our Friday night picnic is still going strong for those who need a good meal. Thank you. It makes me so proud of our congregation. If you have a joy or concern to share, please email it to Pastor Jack during the week for us to share here next time. Now we'll have a story from our religious education coordinator, Janae Johnson. Good morning. My name is Janae Johnson. I am the religious education coordinator at UU St. Pete. Be sure to check out our RE lessons on the YouTube channel that you're viewing the video here. And here we are with the children's story. It's called The Brave Mice, a fable by Aesop. There once was a very old cat who lived in a barn, as cats often do. His job in the barn was to catch all of the mice, and he was very good at it. As you can imagine, the mice didn't really like this, so one day they met together to talk about the great harm that the old cat was doing to them. Each one shared a plan that they had by which to keep out of their way. An old gray mouse who was seen to be very wise by the other spoke up. Do as I say. Do as I say. Hang a bell to the cat's neck. Then when we hear it, Ring, we shall know that she is coming and we can scamper out of her way. Good, good, said all of the other mice. And one, rice, one mice rang the bell. Now, said the old gray mouse, which one of you will hang this around the cat's neck? Not I, not I, not I, came the shouts all together and the mice scampered away to their holes. And the things continued as they always had done. The message, saying that you would do something may take one kind courage, but action takes a different type of courage. Real bravery lies in actions, not just words. You guys enjoy the rest of the service today. Thank you, Janae. Having grown up in a family in a fervent but losing battle against alcoholism, I cannot remember ever not knowing the serenity prayer.
It's well known for its adoption by Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was in the Book of Prayers and Services for the U.S. Armed Forces during World War II. It was written by theologian Reinhold Niebuhr in the late 1930s. I suggest it for our meditation together this morning. So take a deep breath or two and consider the simple wisdom of these words for a moment. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. I chose the title for this reflection, The Inevitability of Spring, thinking I could use part of one I wrote several years ago. But that one, as it turns out, was all about the promise and joyfulness of spring baseball. Well, we can kiss that goodbye. We'll be lucky if we get any summertime baseball, and even if we do, it probably won't be with a crowd of fans sharing popcorn. Alas. But spring is undoubtedly here. Even though it's already summer-like in Florida and it was snowing last week in Colorado, some things are inevitable. No matter what tiny organis organism might be attacking our globe and no matter what baseball-free misery has beset my television, the planet continues to revolve around the sun and it has entered that part of its journey that we call spring in this hemisphere. What else is inevitable? About three and a half years ago, many of us were convinced that a certain outcome in the presidential election was inevitable. Whatever interference we may believe happened, we cannot deny that a practical certainty turned out not to be so. And at our church, just two months ago, we had a huge meeting full of hope and promise where our members voted to have our first called settled minister in over a decade. We immediately got busy planning Reverend Jack's installation ceremony. We thought it would be a grand celebration. Didn't happen. Won't happen for a while. Dr. Fauci tells us that a second wave of the epidemic this fall is inevitable. Economists tell us a recession is a sure bet. Politicians tell us that troubles with the presidential election are for sure. What do we do about things that seem beyond our control? You might notice that today's reading from John Buren's and the Serenity Prayer for our meditation have something in common. They're very familiar messages. Buren's message is based on one of Christianity's best known passages in 1 Corinthians. These three abide, faith, hope, and love. Or in the King James version that I grew up on, faith, hope, and charity. Niebuhr's serenity prayer is so well known as to almost be part of the American lexicon. Both passages sound like everyday kind of wisdom. To me, their familiar words feel right for today's challenging times. How does their insight apply to things we cannot control? Niebuhr knows what we need, serenity but how to get there. I'm reminded of a story from my friend Aruna. Her large, wonderful Indian-American family includes a cousin who was an astronaut. In the early 80s, he was preparing for his first space mission. It was risky and thrilling for the whole country. Aruna's family was frantic with excitement and with worry. Aruna said she felt desperate herself to support her cousin and her family. She decided to try something she didn't usually do. She decided to pray. Her way of praying was this. She held a photo of her family, including the astronaut. She sat with it quietly for a long time, gazing at each face, thinking carefully, prayerfully, about what she hoped for as they faced this perilous yet proud moment. She thought about her cousin, trying to feel what he must be feeling, and filling her heart with hope for his safety and pride for his accomplishment. She held on to these thoughts until she felt more peace, more connection, more serenity. 
Then she went and made a huge meal for her family to share the day of the launch. I've thought about Aruna's story so often, about how she combi combined two ways of coping, contemplation and action, in the face of something over which she seemed to have no control. I'm pretty sure neither her praying nor her cooking had any physical effect on that mission, which went perfectly, by the way. But I think both the praying and the cooking were the right things to do. That's what I think we owe to the important things we cannot control. Do what we can, but also give close, loving, grateful attention. Then we can let them go and claim the serenity that Reinhard Niebuhr prayed for. Another example of what people can do in response to inevitable things. The pagans among us, my friend Sabina, my friend Leah, often hold beautiful celebrations for the arrival of spring and other seasons. When the earth reaches particular points on its trip around the sun, they take the time to hold solstice and equinox observances, pausing to observe the moment and express their gratitude for the rhythms that make life on this planet possible. Now we may not believe that the earth or stars take note of these celebrations, but the act of praising and thanking the earth for its and thereby our very existence is meaningful and it enriches the lives of the people who practice it. As I mentioned before, I have a slightly less esoteric and yet quite noble passion, baseball. Don't worry, no game of life metaphors here, just recognition that my obsession with schedules and statistics, along with my happy frenzy when I finally get to see a game, has absolutely no impact on the out outcome of the game itself. I know that. Other than the money that moves from my pocket to that of the team owners, maybe. I have no influence. And yet, my enthusiasm for the game makes in regular seasons for 162 supremely exciting events in my life. Big smiles when I high five James and John after a raise win. The exquisite highs and lows of loving a team and following it closely. The common thread among these three examples, Aruna's prayer for her cousin astronaut, the pagan's observance of the equinox, my devotion to baseball is this attention. By paying careful attention, we increase the understanding and, of, and, and appreciation of connection to things we don't control. It turns out that attention has a role in, get ready for this, I'm about to be in way over my head, subatomic physics. I know close to nothing about quantum level physics, but I do watch NOVA. And I've learned that at the subatomic level, there are particles and events that are changed just by observation. It's hard for me to understand, but there are physical and mathematical models that show certain things are affected simply by having been observed. What? I won't try to say anything more than that. I've probably already horrified any real scientists that are listening. Beyond saying, that it adds some pretty heavy credence to my argument that attention makes a difference. Walking through a garden with a field guide to flowers makes a difference. Listening carefully to the same bird singing the same song every night in your backyard makes a difference. Contemplation of the faces of the people around you makes a difference. Call it mindfulness or prayer or scientific observation is how we reach Niebuhr's serenity or Barron's things that abide. Attention makes a difference and it can enrich our lives. I'll close this part of our service with a favorite pas passage I've shared before from Garrison Keeler. When the country goes temporarily to the dogs, cats must learn to be circumspect, to walk on fences, sleep in trees, and have faith that all this woofing is not the last word. Shut up and be beautiful and wait for morning. 
Even in a time of vanity and greed, one never has to look far to see the campfires of gentle people. All the places where grace shines through. Let's all tend those campfires. We are those gentle people. We are the places where grace shines through. Thank you for being together and for being my congregation. We're going to end with a beautiful song from James and John. Let's pay attention. This pretty planet spinning in space, your garden, your harbor, your holy place. Golden sun going down, gentle blue giant, spin us around all through the night. Safe till the morning light, this pretty planet spinning in space, your garden, your harbor, your holy place, this pretty planet Sun going space, your garden, your harbor, your holy place. Spring and sun going space, your garden, your island, your spin us around. All through the sun going round, gentle everybody. We love you. to me.